Okay, so oh, um, before I start, I want to remind folks that um, the lecture is always streamed um, live on YouTube. And if you go to the playlist in our channel and couldn't find the video, the video is somewhere in the channel. So sometimes uh, I forget to add it to the playlist. But if you notice that, feel free to send me a quick email and I will do that. But um, it, it should be public and it's within that channel, I believe. Okay, so last uh, lecture, we talk about sort of one general class of topological descriptors, sometimes called topological structure, sometimes called topological summary. It's called, um, they are the merge tree and contour tree and rib graphs. So they are more of graph-based um, topological descriptors. And specifically, uh, their structure relies on the level set of the function or the sub-level set of the function. In other words, you know, the level set of the function sometimes is also called contours. Okay, so it's kind of the structure is rely on those contour behavior. Okay, so this is a picture, right? On the top is that if you're giving me a scalar function, the rib graph, the contour tree, the merge tree we talk about is relying on the behavior of level set or the contours of the function. Okay, and then you kind of shrink those contours into points and you get an abstract representation of the scalar field where it highlight its critical points right in this case it's a tree uh, it's in what i'm showing here is a contour tree which is a tree based structure that connect all the critical points of the domain that include local maximum local minimum and then saddles so and the other type of topological descriptors are called more smell complex. And then there's also, uh, they are based on what's called Morse complex. And that is a focus of today's lecture. The difference between this topological descriptor and the ones we described last lecture is now it's based on the gradient behavior of my function, okay? So what do I see here? If I look from top down, right? So what Morse co smell complex does it partitions the domain of the function into regions where the points in the same region have a similar gradient behavior. So, and it's called a complex because it's not just a graph-based structure, it actually involves what's called zero cell, which are the zero dimensional, right? Which are zero dimensional cell, which are vertices of the domain. And then there's also what's called one cell, which are those white uh, uh, arcs. They are also part of the domain and there's a one dimensional feature of the more smell complex. And then there's what's called two dimensional domain or two dimensional cell. Sorry, they are called two dimensional cell, which are the colored regions in the domain. Okay, so the complex itself is really formulated for the two dimensional scalar function as zero dimensional, one dimensional, and two dimensional cell. So, in other way, that it's not just contain vertices and edges, it's contain vertices, edges, and regions in the domain. Of course, what I'm showing here is what's called a two dimensional more smell complex that arises from a 2D scalar field. If I increase the dimension of my scalar field, which means the domain, let's say if the domain of my function is now three dimensional, then we will also have, in addition to zero, one, two cell, we will also have, have three dimensional cell. Okay, so the dimension of the cell will sort of scale with the dimension of the domain. Okay, so more small complex is again de describing detail in the textbook we're using, and then this is sort of a high level view. To understand the definition, we have to start with what's called a Morse cell, Morse complex. So a Morse complex is really related to more small complex. And to start, let's say I have a smooth manifold embedded in our, uh, remember a manifold is where locally you look like a, a, a plane of dimension n, right? So in this case, you know, in most practical applications of Morse complex and Morse smell complex, we are very much rely on the uh, manifold to be in two dimension or three dimension, because those are the data that commonly arise in scientific simulations. Okay, but the definition for most complex generalized to any dimension. 
So I have sort of a domain, which is a smooth manifold, and I have a function defined on it, and that's my, my function f. So now I have a scalar function, right? It's a real valued uh, function that defined on this manifold, and it has a particular gradient. And this is my notation for gradient. If you recall that a point is called critical if it has zero gradient, otherwise is regular, okay? So this is uh, in 2D, uh, the critical points are local maximum, right? If you remember for two manifold, this is local maximum. This is local minimum. And this is a saddle, right? Those are three types of critical points for a two-dimensional scalar function. And the local maximum, local minimum, and saddle points are the critical points. Other, other points are called regular points, okay? So what's one thing we need to talk about is what's called integral line. So what happened is at uh, every regular point, the gradient is well defined and integrating it in both ascending and descending direction will trace out what's called an integral line, which is a maximal pass whose tangent vector agree with the gradient. So what does that really mean? Let me show you a picture. So for the time being, ignore the color of the domain, right? Because the color in the domain is actually the, uh, the most complex. But let's look at a point in this sort of um, a brown bump. If I focus on a particular point here, let's call this point Z, okay? This point Z, if you look at locally on that, because it's not a local maximum, nor local minimum or saddle, in this picture, the local maximum is a red dot, the saddle is a green dot, and local minimum is a blue dot. So Z is not a critical point, so it's regular. So that means the gradient at that location is non-zero. So at this location, I can look at what is my gradient direction. Um, I'm defining the gradient um, as sort of in the ascending direction, right? The gradient of this function is in the ascending direction. So the integral line is basically starting from this point and trace out a line that is in the ascending direction in the domain and in the descending direction of the domain. So the green line I just drew, hopefully you can still see it, is what the integral line at this point is. Another very straightforward understanding of the integral line, if you put, if you put a, say, a bowling ball at that location, um, the, in the descending direction, that's where the bowling ball is going to kind of roll. And in the ascending direction, you kind of flip the function that's exactly where the bowling ball is going to move. So in some sense, this is really the fastest direction that the function is increasing and decreasing. So that's what's called integral line, okay? So now you have this integral line. Every single integral line will begin and end at critical points. So this is not too surprising if you think about it. Again, starting from my point Z that I just drew, let's say this is my point Z, okay? If I put a bowling ball there, where is that ball is going to eventually move to? It's going to move towards this local minimum right here, okay? And of course, if I flip the function, it's going to go towards the local maximum. So every single integral line that is coming out of a regular point is going to be kind of connecting essentially a, a pair of critical points. Okay. And of course, depends on the direction. Now we need to define the following. Uh, ascending manifolds of a critical point are defined at the point whose integral line starting at that critical point and descending manifold of a critical point are defined as the points whose integral line that end at that point. So let's start with descending manifold. So if descending manifold for it to actually be meaningful in our topological descriptor is the ones that is surrounding the local maximum. Remember the definition of descending manifold is all the critical, uh, all the points whose integral line end at it. 
So that's exactly what I'm doing here. In this entire domain on the left hand side, is actually partitioned or the color region are the partition of the domain by descending manifold. Why? Because intuitively, they're just all the part of the domain that's surrounding individual bump. What is individual bump? Each of the individual bump is a local maximum. So this is a partition of my two dimensional domain into regions where each region contains a single local maximum. And then the points belong to a single sort of cluster in this case, when their gradient flow to the same local maximum, right? So for example, if I zoom into this area where I'm focused on this brown region on the right, every single point in this domain, this piece of brown region, if I trace out the gradient, it will end at the local maximum x. Does that make sense so far? So in a way that think about the descending manifold of a way to partition the domain surrounding the local maximum, OK? And of course, there is points in this boundary of it. And then this descending, mani this descending manifold partition the domain. And then what you see here is also called the Morse complex of my function f. So when I compute the Morse complex, is is a partitioning of the domain surrounding the local maximum. And in this case, again, the critical points are the zero dimensional cell, the boundary a one dimensional cell, and the interior of this is a two dimensional cell, okay? So the next definition is the ascending manifold. And ascending manifold kind of happen, defined symmetrically. It's all the points whose gradient, whose integral line start at that point. So what that mean? That is partition my same domain by regions surrounding local minima, OK? And, and this is also the Morse complex of minus f. So what does that mean? If I take the current function as I showed you and I invert it by taking its negative values, then I compute the Morse complex of this minus f where basically local minimum become local maximum. So your partition is now surrounding local maximum of minus f, okay? But for the time being, let's describe it from the perspective of all the points belong to the same cluster if their integral line starts at a point. So in this case, I am partitioning of the domain surrounding the local minima, okay? So for example, in this case, point Y is a local minima, and all the points is in this sort of, um, all the points is in this kind of green region because all the points in this region have the same origin, okay? So again, you can think about a partitioning of the domain by those ascending manifolds into regions surrounding local minima, okay? Now you have both definition of ascending manifold and uh, descend, uh, a descending manifold. They are actually both partitioning of the same domain. So, so each of them de decompose the domain into cells, right? So for example, all the color cell here are the two dimensional cell all the color cell here, another two-dimensional cell, but they are um, one coming from descending manifold and one coming from ascending manifold. Then the definition of more smell complex, well, first of all, before I talk about more smell complex, each of those cell is, is forming what's called the Morse complex of F and minus F as what I just described. And then the final thing is that if I take the intersection of those cells, which is intersection of ascending and descending manifold, that give you what's called more smell complex. So the more smell complex is actually on a high level uh, intersection of two type of domain partition, right? So the first type of domain partition partition the domain surrounding the local maximum. The second type surround the domain or decompose the domain into local minimum. 
So both are essentially partition of the domain. And if you take an intersection of partition, or those partition can also be considered as hard clustering, you take the intersection of those clusters, you get a more refined partition of the domain. And that refined partition is now what's called more smell complex. Okay, for example, if I look at the area where we focused before this, this uh, descending manifold, when this manifold is intersect with a bunch of sort of uh, ascending manifold, what happened is that the sort of the partition from ascending manifold further divide the descending manifold into four different pieces. Okay, so that's what you get. But in the detail, how do you, how does it look like? Let's just zoom in a bit. Okay, so this is a zoom in view of the more smell complex. Of course, this is a pretty regular behaved function. What you see actually is you see if you look at the, this particular region, this blue region, that is a particular two dimensional cell of my more smell complex. What is the property associated points in the blue region? If I start with a point, let's say I have a point X in this region, and I'm going to follow the gradient. If I follow the gradient in the ascending direction, it's going to go this way. And the gradient in the descending direction, of course, is going to go this way. So what that means is that if I trace the integral line surrounding this point, it's, to, it's going to end up on a pair of local maxima and local minima. So let me redraw it better. Okay, so from this point. So for every single point in the interior of this domain, this is point Y. If you trace out the gradient, the ascending gradient direction is going to end up on the same local maximum. The descending um, direction is going to end up the same local minimum. So another way to think about the more smell complex is a partition of points in the domain based on uniform gradient behavior. Okay, so every single point in my blue region I just drew have sort of their origin and destination of their integral line to be the same. Now, if I move away from this region, if I say I look at this purple region, you know, I have two points. Any two points in any point in this purple region, again, if I trace the integral line, is again going to have a new pair of origin and destination. And for example, if I also focus on, you know, even just adjacent region right here, again, if I trace out the gradient behavior, right, it's going to again have a different pair. So as I mentioned before, the more smell complex basically partition the points in the domain based on their gradient behavior. If their origin and destination is the same pair of critical points, in this case, a pair of local minimum and maximum, then they are in the same cluster, okay? In another way to think about it, geometrically, every single piece of this partition or every single cluster, colored cluster, you see in the domain, the gradient inside of it varies monotonically, okay? That's another way to think about it. Now, once you have this, those colored points are my zero cell because they are the critical points. Those boundary golden edges are one dimensional cell. So they are basically like edges connecting critical points. And then the colored region are the two cell of the more smell complex. Okay, so that's what more smell complex looks like. Of course, what I showed you here is a more small complex for two dimensional scalar function. So the domain is two dimension. So each of the partition is essentially sort of like a two dimensional manifold piece. If you increase underlying dimension, you are going to see some sort of what's called three dimensional cell. And three dimensional cell, the sort of underlying philosophy is the same, 
is that if you, you know, now if I drew a three-dimensional cell, points are in the same three-dimensional cell. If the, again, if you follow their integral line, it's going to have the same origin and destination. So, okay. And the next thing that happened for sort of more small complex is what's called persistence-based simplification. So what does that mean? Remember, this is more smell complex is coming from a scalar function defined on the domain. And I can compute persistent homology of the, the scalar function. And then the persistent homology will pair up the critical points, okay? So for the time being, if I'm going from, let's say I'm, I'm looking at a filtration that goes from top to bottom, Right, I'm looking at the super level set of this function uh, because my function is drawn this way. But what's happening is, let's say I have a function. This is my height function, but I'm computing persistent homology of say minus f. What does that mean is I'm looking at the sub level set filtration of this. And let me just draw it on the side. What happened is that you know I'm always looking at the part of domain that is above certain threshold. This is called super level set or okay so persistent homology of minus f but in some sense i'm building a filtration that is built based on the super level set so i am looking at f inverse minus oh sorry super level set is above certain threshold f inverse of a to infinity this is just a different way to build a filtration i can build a filtration by decreasing my a from positive infinity. So this is, as this level, I have one component in my super level set. At this next level, I have two component in my super level set. Okay. And at the next level, whoops. And next level, those component merge into one another. Okay. I only want to show a very small step because all the point I want to show is when those when each of the component born in terms of persistence, the first component born at point Z, the second component is born at point X, and those two components in the super level set merge at the set of point Y. So what I mean in persistence is that the younger component dies. So the component that born at time X merges with component that is born at time z at y, but x is born later. So x and y are paired with each other, OK? So x, y is a pair in my persistent diagram based on my sub, a super level set filtration, OK? So super level set filtration is going from a decreasing function value, OK? And in this super level set filtration, you know that x, y are paired with each other. And if I were going to do persistent simplification, I want to sort of remove this feature from my domain. And then the way to do this is actually smooth out this little bump that is created by x. So what is mean by geometrically? It's very similar to what we see actually from last lecture when we are talking about denoising uh, data from astronomy, right? So if you have a mountain that looks like this, where this local maximum and saddle define this little tiny bump, the way you can do it is kind of push this bump to be something like this, right? This is one way to simplify it. And remember, we talk about the other two ways, right? Is that if I have this thing here, I can also push the saddle a little bit higher. Then you get a simplified version like this. Or intermediately, you can push down the maximum a little bit, push down the saddle a little bit, push up the saddle a little bit, and you get something like this, all right? What I showed here is I actually use the first strategy, which is pushing down the little bump. So in this case, once I push down the little bump, the two critical points actually cancel with each other. This local maximum disappear 
But this picture is showing what is the effect of it with respect to my more smell complex. Because before I have local maximum X, right? And local maximum Z. So I have a partition of my domain surrounding those two local maxima. In fact, if you look at the neighborhood of local maximum X, you see various partitions, right? This is one partition. And this is another partition, right? And then if you look at the points in each of those partition, their gradient, let me call it P and Q, their gradient will end at critical point X. But now because I applied simplification, what is going to happen? Their sort of integral line or their gradient used to end at X, but X is no longer a critical, uh, a critical point after I have applied simplification, right? In fact, it's become a regular point. Then what's going to happen is those gradient that used to flow towards X is now going to flow towards the nearby local maximum. So that nearby local maximum is point Z. Okay, so the white lines I just drew is that originally from this point, let's call it point P, its gradient flow towards X. And after simplification, its gradient is going to flow towards Z. So in some sense, after I applied persistent simplification, the partition of the domain based on more smell complex is going to be rearranged. In another words, it's actually merged, okay? So in the way that if you look at it, is that because of this redirection of gradient behavior, this region where the simplification has happened is have a reduction in the number of partitions. Because essentially what used to be part of the partition that flow towards X now flow towards Z. Okay, so that is what's called persistent simplification of more smell complex. Okay, so this is a, a picture, you know, um, as I already drew from the top down approach, every single point is in a partition of the more smell complex when their gradient or their integral line have the same origin and same destination as what's showed in the middle picture. All those white lines shows the direction of integral line that starts with local minimum y and end at local maximum x. So there's a question of how do I do this in high dimensional space? What if each of my, sorry, what if my domain is high dimension? So it turns out in high dimension, what you have to do is a approximation of the Morse mill complex. So let's say each of the point here is a high dimensional point. So let's call this point Z. It's a high dimensional point. So you have, you know, coordinates. Let's say it's 10 dimensional points. Okay. So how do I sort of approximate uh, in practice a more small complex? Remember at the core of the definition, it's based on a partition of the points in the domain based on their gradient behavior. So if I can estimate the local gradient, I can just cluster the points based on its gradient behavior, all right? So this is what it happens, is that for the first step to do is to connect all points in the high dimensional uh, domain using what's called k-nearest neighbor graph or what's called epsilon neighborhood graph, okay? So what is a k-nearest neighbor graph? I pick up a K, of course, you need to be smart about how to pick K, uh, and K sort of should be scaling with respect to underlying dimension. It's just to say that for every single point, if I fix K, let's K say K is equal to five, I'm gonna connect with five of my neighbors, which is exactly what's pictured here, you know, at most five of my neighbors. And then that, what that means is that I'm going to try to connect or represent my point cloud by this graph structure. There's also the alternative way called epsilon neighborhood graph, which is if I have a bunch of points and I pick up an epsilon size neighborhood, 
So this is a ball of radius epsilon surrounding the giving point. And I'm going to connect only the points that is in this epsilon neighborhood, okay? So I only connect to my neighbors, which is within epsilon away from me. So that's another way to construct a neighborhood graph. So either way, what you end up is a graph structure on your high dimensional point cloud. And now this is the graph is what you are going to use to approximate the more smell complex. The only thing I need to do is for every single point, I want to estimate its gradient direction, okay? But first of all, you know, there's another thing is that this point cloud is sampled from some high dimensional function. So every single point has a function value. So to decide wh what is, whether the point is critical, I can look at, for example, let's say my point X shown here is a local maximum. Why? Because I just need to look at all my neighbors and to see all the neighbors has a lower function value than X is a local maximum. Why is a local minimum? Because if I look at all its neighboring, you know, immediate adjacent points, if their function value is all larger than Y, then Y is a local minimum. So this is how you decide, you know, whether the point is a local maximum or minimum. Now, you know, if a point is regular, that means half of the point on one side of its neighbor is above, have a function value above, and one side has a function below. For example, let's call the point P here. I say this is say a local, uh, a regular point because for example, the this two point that is, you know, marked by a cross has a function value above it. And maybe, or maybe this one also has a function value above it, but then maybe those two has a function value below it. So in a way that, you know, you have some neighbor that is above and some neighbor that is below. Of course, the last question you might ask me is how about a saddle? As we mentioned before, in this case, this point in the middle is a saddle. Let's say this has a function value of one. And then this two neighbor has function value, you know, five and seven, which are both above it. And then the two neighbor has a function value below. Let's say this is 0.9 and 0.8. Then this point here in the middle is a saddle point, right? Because if I go around it, it has above, below, above, below. That is how the function value is distributed in its neighborhood. And this point is then a saddle point. Anyway, so, so if you are giving a point with a function value surrounding it, and this point is a regular function. So this point, let's say a point is, has a function of value of one. And again, let's say it still have just four neighbors. Then I say, okay, maybe two, this two of its neighbor has function value two and three. And another two of its neighbor has function value 0.8 and 0.9. Then this point right here is now considered a regular point because some of its neighbor is, uh, is, has a function value above, some of its neighbor has a function value below. Now the question is, which direction is, uh, is increasing the function the fastest, right? In this case, I can approximate my ascending sort of direction, which is my gradient direction by looking at the neighbor who had the largest gap in function value. So in this case, this edge between function value of one at the current point and the function value of three at the neighboring point is a direction where my function value increased the fastest. So that became my ascending direction. And the other direction is my descending direction is looking at my neighbor whose sort of gap in decreasing is the largest. And in this case, it would be say this direction because the difference is 0.2 versus other difference is 0.1. All right, so this is how you estimate essentially the integral line surrounding this point. And then once you do this, you can estimate the direction of the integral line for every single point in the domain. And if they end up in the same local maximum and the same local minimum, you cluster them into one single cluster. So that's how you approximate the more smell complex in high dimension by estimating local gradient based on neighborhood graph, all right? The drawback of this is that it works well in practice, but the drawback of this is it has multiple parameters. 
you need to figure out what is my epsilon neighborhood. If you're using epsilon neighborhood to construct the graph, you need to figure out what is K if you're using K nearest neighbor to construct that graph, right? And most importantly, there has not been too many known theoretical results to say how good your approximation is, right? This is a big theoretical gap. And I can tell you it's not a very trivial question is that if I do this approximation and assuming my point is sampled from some smooth underlying manifold with a function defined on it, then how good is my approximation is actually something that is very challenging to answer, even though this framework works in practice. All right. Okay. Any questions? If there's um, no questions. Oh, let's sorry, I just had a quick yeah, question. Yeah. Um, I may have missed it, but uh, how are the points in that graph, uh, how are they sampled from the uh, manifold? Ah, so very good question. Um, it can be given by you. Like usually you assume there's a sampling process. Okay. okay this, this is actually what happened. So for example, like, you know, one way to think about it, let's say I have a Stanford bunny, which is a mesh structure, right? Um, how do you get the initial sample from the Stanford bunny is you have this solid uh, you have this, let's say you have this solid model, you kind of scan it by actually only sample points from the surfaces. And each point, let's say, have a height function defined on it, right? So, so my starting point when you try to approximate it is assuming there's some sampling process underneath that give me this uh, point cloud. And then each point has a function value defined on it. One way to think about it, where does those point, uh, where does those sort of points coming from? For example, you can imagine for some high dimensional parameter space where every single parameter combination give rise to some observation. Then you can imagine this, every single point is a parameter, is a, is a, is a high dimensional parameter space parameter combination. And then the function is some sort of observed variable. A very precise, actually in the next slides, uh, I'm, the second part of my lecture, I'm going to talk about what if my point cloud is coming from say nuclear simulation where every single point is a high dimensional parameter combination. Um, and then the scalar function is the simulated temperature of the nuclear core, okay? So those arise essentially from scientific simulations. Does that cool. make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, but then for geometric object, there's some sampling process where you obtain points from the surface of a mesh. That's another sort of common way where points come from, right? So, so I think one of the application, I, yeah, we'll see what application story I decide to include. Some application, actually at the beginning of the uh, semester, we talk about, um, uh, we talk about sort of using more small complex to segment uh, surfaces that are coming from combustion. And in there, again, you know, it's, it's a bunch of, say, think about it as a particle simulation, and those particles is your point cloud. Okay. All right. So quick break. Um, we'll be back um, in maybe uh, three or four minutes. Um, and then we'll talk about applications of more smell complex.
All right, let's um, resume and talk about applications. So one of the first few applications of, um, of more smell complex is actually a terrain simplification. So not surprising, right? Because the example, even the definition of more smell complex is pretty much kind of defined over a two dimensional terrain. So what you see on the upper left corner is actually a, a piece of, uh, you know, piece of a region. I think this is, um, um, this is, I believe this is part of Washington, no? Anyway, so you see some river, you see some mountain, and the lower picture here is really the underlying more small complex. Actually what is drawn, you know, in terms of the points are critical points and the lines are the one dimensional cell, right? So it's drawing zero dimensional cell and one dimensional cell of the more small complex. And every single region in here, right? Is a two dimensional cell. So what you see here is that from upper left to right to the bottom, what you are applying is actually a simplified version of the underlying terrain, right? And then this is applying what I called persistent simplification. So what did that do? This is exactly the process that applied for the entire region. So you pick up a particular persistence level. Remember the persistence of this two pair is a high difference between these critical points. So it's a tolerance level, right? We're saying that let's get rid of the bumps that is below that level. So, so or getting rid of all the persistent features that is has a persistence smaller or equal to some threshold. So this is what you have is that you are actually simplifying uh, the terrain. But if you look at the actual behavior of the scalar field after simplification, it's very, it's hard to actually detect any visible sort of changes. But if you actually look at the underlying more small complex, it's actually quite, um, it's actually simplified dramatically. Okay. So the question is that why do we even want to do that? For example, if I want to perform any sort of downstream analysis over this terrain, it reduces the, the, the complexity of the domain, right? In term, like if I'm just storing, for example, the underlying more small complex, the simplified more small complex, it's much smaller than the original one. But the, the beauty of it, of persistent simplification, is I'm still preserving the dominant feature of this terrain. When I say dominant feature, I really mean the features that has high persistence, right? In this case, the left bump has, has lower persistence on the right bump. So I'm preserving essentially large mountains with high persistence, which are dominant feature of my terrain. Okay, so the second sort of application of this is how more small complex actually inter interface with machine learning. And then this is what's been developed back, you know, like more than nine years ago called more smell regression. So what is the idea? Okay. So let's say on the left hand side, left hand side is a sort of a visualization of a more smell complex in a very smooth domain. So what's happened is that this piece of surface, again, is a two dimensional function is decomposed into pieces where each colored piece is my two dimensional cell of my more small complex. But one of the most interesting aspect of the more small complex is the fact that each of the points belongs to the same cluster have the same gradient behavior. And then that two dimensional cell is actually the function value changes monoton uh, monotonically, right? So what does that remind you? If I have a bunch of points whose function changes monotonically, right? Let's each point, it has a location X, it has observation Y. If Y, which is observation on that point changes monotonically, you see something in one dimension, you see something like this, right? What that reminds you? Linear regression, right? You can now fit it with a straight line. And of course, in this case, this is two dimensions. So I have a two dimensional point cloud whose function value roughly change monotonic, uh, monotonically. Then if you think about a linear regression, what do you do? You fit it with a hyperplane. So that's what's 
the and and you know the illustration mean is that because I can partition my domain into those monotonic region, I can try to fit all the points belongs to each region, in this case, each two dimensional cell by a hyperplane. And now I am going to basically taking the mixture of those linear regression model together that became what's called Morse smell regression. So basically when I have a point I want to predict it's, uh, I want to predict its value depends on where it falls onto. It's going to force into one of those many linear regressor. And you're going to use that local linear regressor to predict its behavior. Okay, so this is also called, you know, this is also belongs to a family of what's called a partition based regression. So the idea is we are going to use some information from the domain to partition the domain into uh, different pieces, different partition. And for each partition, you fit a, a regression model. And then your global regression model is a combination of all those models, right? That's why it's, I said it's a mixture because depends on where you fall, you call a separate model for that prediction. And the partition-based regression is kind of interesting because you know if I have a very complicated function I want to regress against, um, if I just want to try to fit a single model, it might not be very effective. For example, you know, if I'm just using the most simple model, if my sort of my actual uh, predictive function looks very curvy, and if I try to fit with, uh, say, a single linear regression model, no matter how I fit it, it's not going to have the good fit, right? So in this particular case, it's much better to divide the domain into different pieces where each piece can fit a linear model nicely, right? That is really the philosophy of more smell regression. Of course, you might, you might say, ah, you know, this is an example where I cannot really use a linear model. Maybe I can use like a Gaussian process, right? If I use a Gaussian process regression, which by itself is a mixture of Gaussian function. So this is called Gaussian process regression. Then I can probably fit this. That's fine, but that's another class of regressors, right? So what I'm focused on here is that you can actually use the sort of the property of the more small complex to derive a partition based regressor. Okay, that's really the, the key part of it. So where is it used, right? So, okay. So, so not only that, you can actually do, you know, each of those pieces is now a linear regression. You can also talk about this regression model in term of um, sort of the persistence attached to it, okay? So what you are showing here, it's actually showing that in addition to me fitting each of those um, sort of pieces with a linear model, you can also employ the idea of persistence to kind of talk about sort of how important that particular piece of linear regressor is. So um, I would encourage you to actually look at sort of the, the paper for some technical details. And then this is an example of based on that, based on this idea, actually the first piece of work coming out is to try to also build a visual exploratory tool using this high dimensional, uh, using this uh, more smell um, uh, uh, complex. So, so the idea is quite simple. If my data, looks like just coming from a plane, then, you know, you know, if I compute a more small complex, it's going to give me one single partition. And then one single partition is going to fit with a particular linear model. And in this case, they are representing this linear model based on a straight line, okay? And then the sort of the thickness of the line, right? This kind of transparent tube surrounding it is really measuring the variance at a particular function value. So this, in this case, the function value is very uh, uniformly. So this tube is of a uniform um, sort of band, uh, uniform thickness. Now the same model where again, it's monotonic, except the function value has a different variance, 
then of course you see this transparent tube has a slightly change, but still it's because it's monotonic. So I fit it with one single line. The next model is now, remember now this is a surface and it has sort of multiple um, pieces if I compute the more small complex. For example, for surrounding this local maximum, there is going to be this particular piece. Oh, sorry, let me just drew it. This will be a particular piece of the more small complex that begins where every single point begins with a local minimum and end with a local maximum. So again, this became a monotonic piece and you're going to replace this piece by a line because this is a monotonic piece that represent a sort of, a, you know, you can fit essentially a regressor in that and that regressor is represented by this line. Similarly, on this piece here, you have local maxima right here, local maxima right here. So you can imagine there would be sort of pieces in here that is part of a more small complex. This is local maximum, this is local minimum. And what you do is, again, you fit a regressor that connect local minimum with local maximum. That corresponds to this line. So, and of course, things become a little bit more complicated if your underlying terrain is like, say, a volcano, right? Um, let's say, and at least one of them, let's say I perturb a little bit, this is a local maximum, and then those are all local maximums. Again, you decompose this domain into more small complex. And for each piece of the two cell in the more small complex, uh, you fit a line through uh, as a representation. So what you end up getting is you have a scalar function. And then and in this case, the scalar function does not have to be 2D. It actually can be approximated in high D as we, what we described before. But what you obtain is essentially a skeleton representation of the behavior of this function. And now you can use this scalar representation to explore the behavior of this function. So this is a visualization paper, but it's based upon, again, the idea uh, of more small complex and representing each monotonic region by a line to summarize it, okay? So this is an example where we actually use a very similar framework, but to study a specific data set that arise from nuclear engineering. So in this particular case, this is actually not really that high dimensional. It's actually a three dimensional parameter space um, that corresponding to sort of the thermal behavior in a nuclear simulation. So you have three parameters, uh, gradient and power and so on and so forth. And what you see here in the middle picture is, um, is essentially the, the sort of the point cloud projection of it. And then the, 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 the picture here is really a projection of those line structure you see right here. So what is happening is that you are partitioning the domain based on, again, the local gradient estimation. And then so you, you get sort of multiple uh, different uh, areas in this, in this three-dimensional point cloud. And it turns out that what you want to focus on is a particular piece of the partitioning that corresponds to a region of interest for the domain scientist. So again, you can kind of use the same example, try to estimate the sort of the underlying more smell complex and replace each of the two dimensional cell by a line. And that can be used to explore this three dimensional parameter space. And there's also the study of using more small complex, again, in this case, is also perform uh, simplification. In this case, this is a hydrogen data set. And then on the left hand side is the scalar field you observe. I think in this case, the scalar field, if I remember correctly, is some sort of e e electronic uh, potential. So if you compute the coarse level more small complex, you see a very noisy behavior of the underlying scalar field. And however, if you actually apply persistent based implication, you get a very clean, simplified version of it, which actually indicate the underlying structure of hydrogen. 
So there's many applications of more smell complex. What I just showed here is only a very small sample of it. And then there is a lot of readings I recommend you go into. A uh, more smell complex is, is a tool that is developed uh, first in the area of computation topology. So it's first developed by computer scientists and mathematicians, and then it took off you know, pretty much in data analysis, especially in data visualization. So I know I have a fairly short lecture on more small complex. So um, I have prepared so that, you know, if there's no more questions, I'm going to talk a little bit over the next uh, sort of uh, topic, which is using topological data analysis for time series analysis. I, I believe we have one or two class project that is surrounding time series analysis. And that's what I want to focus on. Okay. But before I do that, any question surrounding more smell complex. Okay. All right, no. Okay, so more smell complex actually has a lot of applications uh, in data analysis and visualization. Um, and again, if you want to compute it, um, it comes in one of those open source software called TTK. So the good news is over the past few years that um, you know people have starting to really appreciate open source, easy to use uh, software tools to compute uh, those topological structures we described um, you know, last lecture and this lecture. So uh, um, a lot of topological structure, for example, things like merge tree and things like contour tree, things like more smell complex are actually can be computed by using TTK. So TTK is what's called topology toolkit. Okay, so I will encourage you to explore um, this open source tool and uh, and to compute, you know, some of those uh, objects we just described in today's lecture. Okay. All right. If there's no more question, let's move on to the next topic. Okay, I'm kind of creep a little bit into my uh, my Thursday's lecture, but that's fine. And we, we have to switch kind of gear a little bit, you know, we, let me give an overview of where we have been so far. So when I'm thinking about topological data analysis in general, there's roughly two type of tools. One is persistent homology, okay? And persistent homology function, which like on the high level is really a tool that is used to separate feature from noise. And it deals with, for example, point cloud data, graph data, and so on and so forth. If you want to compute persistent diagram, all you need is a way to build a filtration from your data, right? If your data is images, you know, as the mini project one and two, you, you convert the image into some sort of point cloud representation or sub-level set filtration or RIPS filtration, then you can get the persistent diagram, which summarizes the behavior of the topological feature in the data. And the persistent homology is directly connected to persistent simplification because once you get sort of the persistent diagram, some of the points has high persistence which you want to maintain. And some of the points has low persistence where you might want to simplify. So it's related to persistence simplification. And I also want to note, and then this is not something in the slides, is that oftentimes people believe that um, sort of the features with high persistence is always the ones that is important. But actually recently there has been a few pieces of work which indicate the features that has low persistence still contains information about the data, right? Specifically, um, there has been a recent work that says features with low persistence, which is those points that is very close to the diagonal of the persistent diagram, actually encode some information regarding the geometry of your data. Okay, so that's a very interesting development. But the very common practice usually is if we have high persistent feature and low persistent feature, you find a separation between the signal and noise and you maintain all the signal and you get rid of all the noise. That's exactly what we did also for denoising uh, the OMA data cube for astronomy, right? Anything that is below a certain threshold, we try to smooth things out. 
Okay, so that is one type of tool, persistent homology. The other type of tool is what we just spent two lectures on, are sort of uh, a summarization of my scalar function such that it kind of maintains some skeleton representation. And then there's two of them, uh, two types of them. One is graph-based, which is uh, sort of reap graph, contour tree, merge tree. Um, and it's graph-based and also based on level set and sub-level set behavior of the function. The second type, more small complex, is based on the gradient behavior of the function. So now those are the fundamental tools that is coming from, you know, uh, you know, one is coming from topological structure, one is coming from persistent homology. But on the very, very high level, I could treat persistent diagram or those sort of tree, uh, reap graph, contour tree, merge graph, and more small complex. On a very high level, I can also call them, I like to call them, they are all topological descriptors because what they are, they are compact, reduced by size representation of my original data, right? So my original data, let's say it's this two-dimensional scalar function is defined on some, for example, mesh structure. And I get a very reduced representation of this data, which only captures the connectivity between the critical points. So this is in some sense a summary or a descriptor that is a, having a very highly compact size. Same thing with persistent diagram, right? It's a very um, sort of reduced size summary of my data. Another way you really, if you really want to think about this philosophically, you can always even think about this as some sort of compressed representation of my data, okay? So now for, you know, I will start by talking about TDA and time series analysis. And then this is now related back to persistent homology a bit. Right. So this is dealing with if I have different type of data, how can I transform the data so that I can apply my topological tool and my main topological tool here will be persistent homology. Okay. So time series data. Uh, before I do that, I also want to emphasize this is a particular question on connectiveness. So remember I said before, when I have, you know, the definition of connected uh, topological space, uh, a space is simply connected if any path in there can be deformed continuously by any other path, right? So I have, say, a path going from X to Y, you know, this alpha path, it can be continuously deformed to Y, versus in this case, I have a path going from X to Y, it cannot be de continuously deformed to another path because there's a hole in the middle, right? And then our topological structure, merge tree, contour tree, are, uh, are, or, um, are based on domain that is simply connected. If the domain is not, then you get reap graph. There's one concept, and this, this is a concept where we haven't seen it, but this concept actually shows up in, also in robotics. Remember, I have this deformation where I say it's, I can continuously transform from one path to another while preserving this endpoint. I have avoided definition of this mathematically until now. This is what's called a homotopy, okay? So a homotopy is, um, is defined between two continuous function and it's a continuous uh, transformation basically that, so I have two function, okay? What I can do is I can define this two curve as two function Let's call it F, and then this is G. This is my alpha and beta in the previous picture. Those are parameterized curves on the domain, meaning that you know when I parameterize it, at every time, depends on where I am, it defines a location of the path, right? So if I go from X to Y, this curve can be defined as a function, okay? So, but homotopy is defined more generally between a pair of continuous function defined on the same domain. It's a continuous function such that at time zero, it's at the first function and time one is at the second function. So what does this mean? That means at every single point in here, this homotopy sort of defined 
where I am in this deformation. So as I'm transforming one pass to another, let's say I have a point P right here. This is where, where it's going to be. It's kind of describe how these points are going to be transformed through. Another way to imagine it is that it's a family of continuous function such that you know the beginning is my original function, the end is my target function, and then there's a continuous deformation for every single point throughout. Okay, so another way to think about mentally is that if I were going to transform my curve F to my curve G, it's going to have this smooth transition going between. Okay, so that's called a homotopy. So think about the homotopy as a way that kind of in the, in the case of, you know, talking about simply connected topological space, it's a homotopy is the one that smoothly transition one curve to another in a continuous way. And if my domain, for example, has a hole in the middle, you know that you cannot obtain a homotopy. And why is this related? If we have time, we can even expand upon the other TDA applications in robotics. What you can imagine is that homotopy and actually some of the persistent homology tool shows up when you are doing motion planning or pass, pass planning of a robot in the domain. Because you can imagine this kind of hole to be say a opt, um, optical in, in, in the terrain. So if you have a particular path that is planned for the robot to go from X to Y in terms of location to avoid, let's say this, 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 this region here is like see a cylinder in the middle of the room then you know that if I have a path of a robot going from X to Y, it will not be able to convert it to a path going from X, Y in the bottom because there's no clear homotopy between them. And why is it related to homology? Because if I compute the homology of this domain, there is a tunnel in the middle. If I'm treating this optical as missing data, right? So that is a tunnel. So there's a tunnel. <laughs> uh, that means I cannot have a smooth transition between those two paths. Okay, anyway, I'm kind of diverging a little bit, but I want to introduce homotopy mathematically. Okay, so, so this is still, this is again going back after you understand the homotopy is that you know a domain is simply connected if it's past connected and any loop can be contracted to a point. So this is another definition of simple past connectiveness or simply connected. So if I have a piece like this, then any path in here, any loop in here can be shrinked to a single point. But then if my domain looks like this, say an annulus, then if I have a path, a loop like this, you know that this loop cannot be shrinked into a single point, okay? And simply connected, even only if it's path connected and whenever there's a path, uh, there's two paths uh, with the same starting and ending point, then it can be continuously deformed while keeping both ends fixed. So this is just a mathematical definition. Explicitly, there is a continuous homotopy. So you can define simply connectiveness using the definition of a homotopy. Um, and then if you see this, past connectedness is weaker than simply connected. A space is past connected if there's a path joining any two points. So you can be past connected, but still has a tunnel in the middle, right? The past connectedness is only talking about does there exist a path between any two points in the domain, but it has nothing to do with whether there it's sim simple or not. Does that make sense? So you can, so both of those space here are past connected because for any two points, there's a path that connect them. All right, so uh, wait, this is just, yeah, go ahead. In the second point, it, it says uh, simply, uh, sim simply connected is equivalent to pass connected. Am, no, am I no, right? But no, it says connected. if and only if, that which means- yeah, There's two conditions. Oh. Simply if, if it is pass connected and whenever I'm, there's two paths. Yeah. I see, I see, conditions. okay. Yeah. No, I got it, sorry. Mm -hmm. So past connected is more relaxed, simply connected is, is more restricted, right? So like I, I said, the space on the left is simply, both spaces I drew here, right? One is this space and one is this space. Both space yeah. is, uh, is uh, past connected 
but only the one on the left is simple, simply connected. Yeah, in one word, the path connected space can have a holes. Exactly. Connected cannot. Yeah. Okay, all right. So this is just a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit over um, topology concepts. Um, I want to start talking about time series analysis, but I want to talk about it through example. Okay. And the example I want to start with is a story from what's called software visualization. And then it's a sort of like a very interesting application of TDA. So the idea is try to detect what we call circular structure in memory reference traces. So what you have, you run a code, you run a piece of code. This is a piece of C code, right? And what you do is you kind of collect the memory access pattern of this program. So what are the memory access pattern? Read and write, that's it, right? So it's actually a linear sequence. That's why I, I treat it as a time series. And then there's something called um, Tuckens embedding, which is how do I take a time series and map it into a high dimensional point cloud? And the next level is to apply persistent homology to that high dimensional point cloud to detect the loops that have high persistence and map it back to my memory reference trace. And with a hope that that pattern will indicate some behavior of my program. Okay. So, so just to give you an example before we go into detail, this is a visualization of the memory access pattern. And then th this is coming from a very simple piece of code, which is bubble salt. Okay, so if you have Ever seen uh, implementation of bubble sort? I mean, if you haven't, I will try to explain it. This is a function implementing bubble sort. Okay. Um, the idea is it takes an input, a bunch of, you know, a list of numbers, and uh, it's kind of compare, always compare adjacent numbers. And then the really the important part of this code is to say that, okay, you know, if I compare two adjacent one, the number at i's location and the number at I plus one's location, I'm sorting from smallest to the largest. So whenever I find something bigger than uh, you know, follow up neighbor, I'm going to swap them. That's what it is. So that's a bubble sort. So in, if I apply bubble sort in a already sorted data, right? If I, you know, if I already have it sorted, then the only set time this program is going to execute is only going to look at the comparison. If there's no swap because it's already sorted. So if I go into this code, what does bubble sort do? It's compare the first to the second. Huh, well, the first is smaller than second the number. One is smaller than two, nothing I need to be done. Now I compare the item in the location two and location three. I compare, no swap. Again, compare, no swap and compare, no swap. Because I compared all adjacent ones and there's no swapping operation, I'm done because I know that my um, my numbers has already been sorted. And this on the left hand side is a visualization of the memory reference trace of this program. And specifically, it's having four loop in the visualization and those four loop corresponds to the four comparison operations. So you know that you go into the loop and it's 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 a full loop, right? That means I go through this why four times. And um, the loopy structure in my program actually corresponding to a circular structure in my memory reference traces through topological data analysis. Okay, so that's an example. What is my pipeline? So remember I said, on, look. On the previous yeah. uh, diagram is the as you travel along the circle that's increasing in time and each blip is it a memory access yeah so good observation the if you go from inside to outside this visualization you designed is yes it goes increasing time every single point is actually a sequence of memory reference trace it's What's a high dimensional a point of it's a sequence of uh, uh, it's a sequence of memory address. You are you are two slides ahead of me. Okay. So I will explain how you get that right here. Okay. So yeah, so overall pipeline, 
if you execute this very small code, all you get is write at an address, memory address, read at a memory address. So your memory reference trace is a linear sequence of memory addresses, read and write, okay? For the time being, I'm actually even going to ignore whether I'm read or write. But of course, you can do more detailed analysis. For the time being, I'm just going to ignore whether it's read or write operation. I only focus on which memory I'm accessing as my program is executing. And I have a way to convert this linear sequence of memory access into a point cloud by doing something called tokens embedding. And once I embed it into a point cloud, you know, I can run persistent homology to detect the most dominant circle in that point cloud. And then I map that back into a visualization of my memory reference. So that's what you get. Okay. But to answer your question, how do I do this? First of all, let's say this is my memory reference. To be sure, my memory reference is really long, even though this is a very small program. You can have you know, thousands of entries in my memory reference. So this is a linear reference, read and write, and so on. And what's called a tokens embedding. So let me, uh, so actually, where's my slides of the tokens embedding? Maybe I skip that, but let's just talk about it using here. What is a tokens embedding, right? Tokens embedding is that I am, let's say I'm going to choose a window size uh, for the time being, let's say my window size is equal to four and my gap size equal to one. So what do I want to do? I want to convert, maybe I use lowercase gap size G. I want to com convert this one dimensional signal to a four dimensional point cloud by taking every four entry and map it into a four dimensional point cloud. That's my window size. So I have the window from the first item to the fourth item. And the gap size is how much I shift my window. And my gap size is one, meaning that I'm going to shift it one at a time. So this became my first data point, which is four dimensional. And now I take the entry from the second to the fifth. This is my second. And then this is my third. So what do I do is I take every four entry and turn it into a four dimensional point cloud. And then I shift it one location at a time. Making sense so far? And then the part that I haven't defined is what is the distance, pairwise distances between these points. Because I'm dealing with memory reference trace, I'm going to use what's called edit distance, which means how many reference trace do I have to edit in order to convert one point to another? Okay, so edit distance is usually defined between say a pair of string. For example, if I have a string that is AAAB and a string that is ABAB, then the edit distance between these two is one because you only need to modify one letter to convert one string to another. That's what we do. We're treating the memory reference trace, so say point X1, as essentially uh, a string with four alphabet. And same thing with X2, which is another string with four alphabet. Of course, in this case, they're right adjacent to each other. Their distance is one because they only differ by one letter. Okay, but of course, later on, you can see, you know, you can see more other points to be similar. So this is how you embed the points. And then this is where I'm going to end today's lecture is that you basically take a one dimensional signal and convert it to a high dimensional point. And this is what's called tokens embedding. You just embed it into a high dimensional point cloud. And then you can apply persistent homology to study that point cloud. And then you take the persistent cycles, map it back to the original data to try to detect the patterns in the original data. And that is what at the core of TDA for time series analysis. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop and uh, any questions? <laughs>